Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar where we'll be discussing property insights and an economic outlook. My name is Donna Koshek and I am the Professional Services Banking Executive for Queensland at NAB. As we begin, I acknowledge that we're meeting across the lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I'm calling in from the, Minj from the area known as Minjin, also known as Brisbane, and the traditional lands of our Yagara and Turrbal people. Mark and Gareth are joining us today from Melbourne, the lands of the Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge and pay respect to the Elders past, present and future, as well as any Indigenous customers and colleagues who will join us today. Our two speakers today are Mark Browning and Gareth Spence. Mark Browning is our Head of Evaluations and Property Advisory at NAB. His responsibilities include residential, commercial and rural valuations, as well as business valuations, panel management, operations and valuation risk and reliability. Gareth Spence is a Senior Economist at NAB. Gareth joined NAB after 10 years at the RBA and provides detailed analysis of the Australian economy and advice on economic developments to NAB, our customers and our network. We're thrilled to be able to share these expert insights with you today and, this, and as Australia's largest business lender, we hope that you'll find today useful in thinking about future opportunities for you and your business. In our session, our experts will be discussing the general outlook for the Australian economy, the Queensland property market, and we'll include some time for, for your questions on these topics. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the page in Zoom to ask any burning questions throughout the webinar, and we will get to these at the end of the webinar with that Q&A session. We're also recording the session today, and we'll be sharing it with our registered participants. As well, there will be a small survey at the end where we'd really appreciate your feedback and taking the time to complete so we can make sure that we use that information to improve future webinars for you all. <laughs> Mark and Garth, you two, property and economics really must be the most popular people, I think, at any party right now. So I've been really looking forward to this event. And I'm going to hand over first to Gareth, um, and he'll give us an update on the economic views. Thanks, Donna. I'll just bring up the slides. Okay, great. Thank you for having me along today. Um, I guess in the time we have available, I'd like to kind of give you a very high level overview of um, some of the big dynamics and forces playing out in the economy uh, globally and locally at the moment uh, and tie that a little bit into the impacts and the feedback loops back from the property market into to the economy before I hand over to Mark to take you through some more detailed uh, analysis of, of the property market itself in Queensland. So I guess just starting at the global level, we're a small open economy in Australia and obviously the global backdrop uh, remains quite important. Nobody needs to be reminded of that after the last couple of years. Um, interestingly, or, or uh, importantly globally, uh, inflation is high, but inflation has now begun to ease. So headline inflation measures across most uh, of the advanced economies have come off quite notably uh, through 2023. Uh, and they look to be easing further as supply pressures continue to fade uh, and the impact of higher rates uh, continues to cool the global economy. Uh, monetary policy rates across most of the advanced economies uh, have risen to their highest levels uh, in around a decade, uh, and they appear to be at or near their peak uh, in most countries. While rates have risen, growth has certainly slowed uh, across the globe, but generally, uh, Generally, we've avoided uh, any major downturns to date. Uh, and related to that, despite the slowing in growth, labour markets uh, across uh, across the advanced economies have remained quite resilient. That said, there remains a few risks, uh, geopolitical risks in both the Middle East uh, and the Ukraine continue to challenge uh, the global economy, particularly through commodity prices, which which have big flow on effects back to Australia. Uh, 
And also the slower than expected rebound out of China poses some risk. For now, though, everything appears to be uh, tracking along relatively smoothly. So turning to Australia, what's really playing out here is not anything that's too different to what we're observing globally. Uh, all eyes for us are basically on the dynamics playing out in the household sector, where uh, very high inflation and the fast rise in interest rates continues to weigh on household balance sheets. If you look at the graph on the left, you can see the black line there that shows you the growth in real disposable income, which is income after interest payments uh, and prices, the impact of prices have been subtracted. Unsurprisingly, this is around 3.2% over the year. Uh, quite unusual for it to fall uh, in real terms, but highlights just the sheer impact that prices and interest rates are having on, on uh, households. Uh, you notice there that the blue line, that sorry, the, the light blue bars are quite large. It shows that inflation at 6% over the year has subtracted around 6 percentage points from disposable income growth. Likewise, the green bars, uh, interest payable, are growing in importance and have continued to weigh on households with higher interest rates continue to flow through to the sector. I guess also interestingly on this is to note that there are some positive offsets uh, at the moment with labour income growing at its strongest rate in quite some time. This is being supported by very strong employment outcomes in the labour market and also uh, decade strong uh, wage growth, at least in nominal terms. And for those with savings uh, and liquid assets, interest receivable is also receiving some benefit from higher interest rates. Another way to look at this is just to look at the mortgage burden. We can see that as rates have risen and been passed through to mortgage holders, that uh, the cost of servicing a mortgage as a share of disposable income has risen to its highest level since around 2012, where rates were a little bit higher, uh, and is certainly well off the lows we saw back in 2022. So how is this playing out across the household sector? Well, one of the things we can look at in our team is as our consumer sentiment survey, where we measure consumer stress by category. Uh, maybe not so surprisingly, but a stark reminder of the costs of higher inflation and maybe a bit of the unevenness of rate rises is, is just where the stress is borne out as these pressures weigh on households. So to date, we can see that Basically, the lower end of the income distribution, larger households with higher cost structures, the unemployed uh, and renters have borne or reported the highest levels of stress. That said, the impacts of high rates and inflation are flowing through generally and most categories have risen over the past year or so. Likewise, in aggregate, the Melbourne Institute Consumer Sentiment Survey remains quite weak, hovering around GFC levels for its longest, longest period on record. Uh, and has kind of, despite the tick up in the last month, remained quite weak. Um, so certainly an adjustment happening at the individual level. Uh, business confidence, which comes from our NAB monthly business survey, uh, has kind of hovered at around zero for, for quite a while now. So it's certainly less optimistic. Businesses are less optimistic than they were through the middle of 2022. Uh, but the con consumer sentiment, uh, sorry, the business confidence uh, appears to have leveled off uh, at a below average, but certainly well above the trough scene uh, at the peak of the pandemic or even in the GFC. So how are these uh, challenges for household balance sheets and sentiment kind of playing out in the real economy? So obviously, uh, household consumption is quite important for Australia, it counts for around 60% of GDP. We can certainly see the adjustment coming through where overall consumption has slowed, uh, in the past two quarters to just 0.4% uh, in quarterly terms after a very strong period of growth through 2021 and 2022. Where are the adjustments coming? Well, discretionary consumption, as you may expect, has fallen for around three quarters in real terms uh, and essential spending has slowed slightly. In terms of the balance between goods and services, something we continue to watch quite closely after the disruption seen through the pandemic, we can see that Good spending certainly has slowed. It's fallen for around two quarters, but has leveled off more recently. Services spending uh, ha had continued to recover, but is also sort of leveling off. I think overall, uh, it's important to note that, you know, spending has slowed. It does remain positive. We have, we're not kind of falling away at any sort of rapid pace, uh, and but there is an adjustment that is coming through. And I guess the right-hand side, where we show the savings rate sort of shows the balance between 
you know, pulling back on consumption and maybe reducing the savings rate. So in net terms, household savings rate fell to around 3.2% uh, in Q2 this year. Uh, it's a little bit below its average uh, from pre-pandemic at around 5.5%, but it is still positive. So a balance for now of, of an adjustment between pulling back on spending and maybe saving a little bit less while income generally remains quite well su supported by a very healthy labour market. Now, while the individual is certainly undergoing some adjustment, uh, economic conditions more broadly appear to be quite resilient. Uh, and this certainly comes through our business survey where we measure actual business conditions uh, every month. Uh, we can see here that when we go out to, to businesses and we ask businesses about what are your trading conditions, your profitability and your employment levels, actually things have stayed quite high. So it certainly has come off the very strong levels we saw earlier in late 2022, uh, but they certainly remain above average. So a bit of a contrast there to, to the weakness we're seeing in the forward-looking indicators of consumer sentiment and business confidence. Uh, and indeed, uh, conditions by industry have remained quite resilient in, in most areas, uh, and that includes retail trade and record personal services, uh, where we think some of the consumer slowdown may become a little bit more evident. So what is the difference and what is the balance here between the individual adjustment underway and the pockets of stress we have seen uh, and the overall general resilience we're seeing in the economy? I think a key sort of story at the moment or a key driver of that is just how strong population growth is uh, across Australia and certainly in Queensland as well. So after slowing to just 0.2% nationwide uh, in 2021, the slowest rate in 100 years, population growth has rebounded very strongly and much more strongly than anybody would have predicted. Um, it rose to around 2.2% uh, in Q1 this year, the strongest rate since late 2008. Uh, when we look at some higher frequency measures of population growth from the Labor Force Survey, it looks like the civilian population growth has accelerated further rising to around 2.8% uh, in annual terms. So uh, where we're at is over the last year, despite that sh slap sh uh, sharp slowing in population growth through the pandemic, uh, migration has rebounded quite strongly and accounts, you know, usually accounts for around two thirds of our population growth. Uh, over the year to March, we saw around 550,000 migrants enter the country. Uh, for Queensland, uh, this has certainly played out as well, a net migration figure of around 70,000 over the year. Also important for Queensland at present is, is just the strength in interstate migration, uh, which has added another 30, 31,000 migrants to the state where population growth is now tracking at around 2.3%. Uh, in addition to kind of supporting the economy more broadly, the population growth is certainly playing out in housing markets across the country. Uh, I'll leave Mark to, to give you a fair bit more detail on, on the property market and price measures specifically. But what I would reflect on is, you know, we've seen rates rise by 400 basis points uh, in the fastest sort of time frame we've seen on record. Uh, and yet house prices have seen very little adjustment. So indeed, after falling by around 9%, which, which is quite large historically, They've actually rebounded very sharply through 2023 today, initially led by Sydney, but uh, more recently, some of the smaller capitals such as Brisbane, Adelaide uh, and Perth have also risen quite strongly. So something we're a little bit surprised at, but maybe not so surprised when we've sort of come to see just how strong population growth is. Uh, another sort of impact on the, the housing market from that strong population growth, where we know migrants typically rent for the first couple of years, is the rental market. So vacancy rates remain near historic lows uh, in most capitals and indeed Brisbane uh, and rents growth has picked up quite strongly. So it is a bit mixed across some of those capitals. It's come off a little bit more recently in Brisbane, but remains at a very, very high rate uh, with vacancy rates looking to remain quite low for the foreseeable future. So against this backdrop of very strong housing demand from, from the rebound in migration and population growth more broadly, um, another confounding factor has been just a slowdown in, in the growth of supply in the market. So Australia-wide uh, rolling annual completions have fallen to around 175,000 dwellings 
that's well off their peak of up near around 200,000 pre-pandemic. Uh, and you can see there in Queensland, rolling annual completions is around 33,000 uh, earlier this, this year and remains relatively low to the period between 2015 and, and 2020. So, you know, while population has rebounded quite strongly, supply has come off uh, quite notably. And I guess no one factor, but some of the confounding things that have, have come out and become a little bit more evident as time goes by is just the impact of interest rates and building costs. So our NAB residential property survey, which is released next week, uh, does provide some insight from respondents into the barriers and to kind of new housing developments. You can see there that construction costs and rising interest rates are both two of the largest factors. They have eased in the latest survey for Q3, but generally do remain high. And I guess speaking to some of the official data on this, we can see that most inputs into the construction sector uh, have risen quite sharply over the last couple of years. The good news is inflation has eased in most of these products, uh, but they haven't really corrected or fallen back to the, their pre-pandemic prices. Um, there has been some adjustment in, in areas such as steel and timber, for example, but generally they do remain high. So something that has certainly flowed through alongside the uncertainty for interest rates for, for, for the construction sector. So somewhat offsetting uh, that weakness in construction has been the very high pipeline of work. So built up on prior approvals and the support from the government through the peak of the pandemic, uh, we now have a pipeline of around 273,000 uh, dwellings under construction or about to be commenced. Uh, for Queensland, that number is also quite high at around 45,000. Um, so as uh, you know, construction delays, supply shortages, labour constraints have weighed on, on the completions, uh, the pipeline has sort of held up and, and will probably, we think, provide quite a bit of support in the near term for the actual level of activity in, in the housing sector. Um, however, building approvals, which is the new flow into that pipeline, have certainly come off and they're tracking at around their lowest level since since 2012. So as we work through that pipeline, there is a bit of a looming challenge where, you know, we'll we'll see those 270,000 dwellings come online, uh, but you know, eventually at at current rates of approvals, completions will track down towards around 150,000 per year, which leaves a bit of a gap uh, to that very strong rate of population growth. So what's the net wash up uh, kind of of all of that? Well. One of the other things that's been coming through our consumer surveys uh, and is you know grabbing a few headlines is, is just the sheer deterioration in housing affordability. So uh, Australia wide and in Queensland, you know the sharp increase in rates um, combined with the fact that house prices have remained high or even increased further, seen affordability decline to its lowest rate uh, in around 20 years. Uh, you can see here that Queensland's actually doing a little bit better at a higher level uh, for now than Australia in an affordability sense, but is is a likely challenge going forward. Uh, I guess relatedly and maybe a little bit more positively is, uh, you know, inflation does appear to have peaked in Australia. Um, you know, we've eased from around a peak of 7 to 8%, depending on which measure we look at, to something closer to around 5 5.5% at present. Uh, that's similar to, to the global trend. Uh, the big story there, I think, has really been that we've seen lots of those supply constraints uh, and global disruptions to goods prices kind of normalising. And you can see that in these charts with the tradable. So this generally includes purchases from goods that we import has come off quite sharply. And we expect that to kind of continue to, to normalise and, and disinflate and possibly even for some goods prices to fall uh, the challenge for us as economists and for policymakers is just what happens to the domestic side of inflation. So these are the non-tradables, things like, you know, food and takeaway services, things uh, that are locally based. We don't trade and they typically have a lot, a larger labor component in their price. Uh, and that's kind of captured by the services on the right hand side. We can see there that it certainly still remains high. Things like rents, uh, the pressure still remains quite strong. And so as those global factors fade, just how strong the services and the tradables, non-tradable side is will become increasingly important for where inflation overall settles uh, in Australia. So part of that story is obviously 
what happens to wages in the labour market for now, uh, despite the slowing in growth we've seen as, as consumption has pulled back, uh, the labour market has been quite resilient. So the unemployment rate has hovered around its 3.5% level for, for almost a year now, around a 50-year low. It's ticked up a little bit more recently, uh, largely driven by just the sheer strength in population growth. So labour demand, uh, as sort of indicated by job vacancies, while they've eased, generally remain uh, very high uh, and kind of point to near term strength in, in labor demand going forward, despite the growth that we've sorry, the slowing in growth we've seen for GDP. So I guess the the risk coming out of this or what we're all watching really is, is what happens to wage growth and does a stronger or higher rate of wage growth become embedded in the economy and then flow back through that services inflation. So for now, uh, it looks okay. So nominal wage growth has certainly risen to its strongest rate since 2012, but at 3.6% doesn't appear excessive. So something we continue to watch as the labor market remains quite tight uh, what does that mean for policy? Well, we think that the RBA, like many other central banks, is near the top. Uh, we think they will hike one further time uh, kind of in November, so the next meeting, taking the cash rate to, to 4.35. Um, but I think really beyond that, the question is, is going to rapidly focus or become how long do they hold rates at restrictive territory? So for now, we've penciled in rates kind of staying at that level of 4.35 until around mid next year before the RBA starts to to kind of cut back towards something that's a little bit more neutral uh, of around 3% through the second half of next year. Like I said, that will really depend for them in the near term on, on how those labour market pressures and wage growth continue to evolve, but also how much disinflation we see on kind of the global side. So overall, where do we think this will take us? So we do think growth will remain quite slow for the second half of this year and into next year. Uh, overall, we'll see GDP growth of around 1% to 1.5%, which is below trend, but it's not quite uh, the recession some of the headlines would have you believe. Uh, obviously, the big driver there is going to be what happens to household consumption, just, just given its size. However, how businesses react to the slowing economy and high rates in terms of business investment and also how households and dwelling investment respond to higher rates will also be quite important. For the labour market, we expect unemployment to stay quite low, but to gradually increase uh, over the next year or so. So from a very low starting point, we think unemployment will rise to something around four and a half to four and three quarters percent uh, by the end of next year. And that's really driven by that strong population growth as uh, as as labor demand growth eases. But I think somewhat importantly, uh, we don't think there will be large scale job shedding or anything of that, that nature. Rather, it's just a gradual adjustment to, to stronger population growth. And we don't see that full on scarring that we often fear about in the labor market, uh, in economic downturns. On inflation, you know, kind of that cooling in demand and easing of pressures in the labor market uh, alongside the easing in the global factors, you know, we're quite confident inflation will continue to come down. It'll be relatively easy gains to get back to maybe the low fours or the high threes. The question after that will really become uh, how long does it take for inflation to kind of settle back uh, at that 2 to 3% range by late 2024, or early 2023. But for now, we see it reaching the top of the target by the end of 2024 and kind of uh, falling back further into the target through 2025. So I might leave it there and hand it over to Mark for some more detail on, on the property market. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone, Donna and team. Thanks again for the invite. Uh, this afternoon, uh, I think it's helpful if we if we just orientate you on the uh, information we'll be sharing. We'll be covering an element of uh, the residential property market and then progressively uh, from a metro, you know, Brisbane, southeast, right through to the wider, uh, wider Queensland uh, perspective, and uh, at the same stage, also touch on uh, commercial uh, and rent roll uh, information uh, as well. We know how important property is to Australians, uh, not only for the creation of wealth, uh, of which you know, fifty six percent of Australians' wealth is held in housing, but more broadly, the importance of to the economy and uh, for those that are part of 
the uh, real estate industry specifically um, activity in, in the space uh, as well. So lots of drivers there. Australia's housing, 10.1 trillion. Uh, commercial real estate, 1.3 trillion. So it's a major driver for all of us, hence, uh, hence the interest uh, in the topic and uh, importance, uh, in particular in Queensland, given, uh, as Gareth said, uh, a key beneficiary of net interstate, as well as international uh, migration and what's uh, planned over the coming decade uh, as well. This uh, gives you a, a national picture uh, with the highlight around Brisbane at a capital city level of houses and units, both quarterly and annually, just to give you a, a sense as to what's been happening across, uh, across the country. Uh, Brisbane's been uh, one of the capitals uh, that has had one of the sharpest and uh, most significant uh, growth in this phase of, uh, of the cycle. And uh, you'll see there um, particularly um, evident uh, in, uh, in units over the course of, uh, of the year as well. Whilst we stay national, um, this is the last three months. Again, Capital C is growing at one uh, 2.5 and regionals at 1.1. Brisbane, in contrast, growing at 3.9% over the quarter, the second fastest after Adelaide, and uh, outpacing out the East Coast uh, uh, comparison cities uh, with regional Queensland uh, performing uh, and growing 2.3%. And you can see on the right-hand side of that page there uh, that, that quarterly growth capitals over time, as well as regional cities over time and how they've tracked uh, for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, as well. Perhaps the other key component is not all properties equal, it's, it's always local, but each price point as well in the market uh, often tracks at a different pace. And this brings to life the most affordable quartile of the market, which is represented there in the red bars, uh, and the most expensive quartile, which is in the, uh, the black bars. Um, in, in Brisbane, it's been relatively consistent uh, and become a more balanced series of growth, both all segments of the market in, in a growth phase. Uh, early on, uh, we saw the, the, uh, most, um, the most expensive quartile experience uh, stronger growth, uh, but uh, as you can see there, it's a, it's a more balanced series of growth occurring uh, across, uh, across uh, Brisbane itself. And then if we look then at sales activity, you'll see there, uh, in for the 12 months to the end of September, in comparison to the 12 months prior, you'll see that rates of sales are off. Now, we, we recall, as Gareth mentioned, we, we've just come out of uh, you know, record levels at low of uh, interest rates and been on a rapid rise. And so in that, uh, in that uh, stage off uh, COVID, net interstate migration with Southerners uh, moving to... Uh, to Queensland, it, uh, we saw heightened levels of activity. So it's not unexpected that that uh, growth has come uh, back off. So in Brisbane, off 17.1, and in regional, off 19.1. Uh, and uh, you'll see the, the other capitals uh, nationally. Um, it's 1% only off the longer term average and, uh, and regional off 6.1. Um, uh, as well, giving you uh, that perspective over a five-year average. If we focus in on Brisbane specifically in, in some more detail, I think it's uh, important to see how here the, the uh, rate of growth is, is continuing to accelerate in Brisbane, up 1.3 alone in the last uh, month, 3.9% over the quarter. It's, uh, it's evident that um, since January, when the, the low point, the trough of the market was uh, was uh, occurred, growth is up 9.1% uh, uh, to the end of September. So that reflects quite strong levels of growth. And you can see the breakup of that growth at the bottom of the page. Dwellings, which is houses and units, uh, for the month, quarter and annually. In the middle of the page at the bottom there, houses, again, month, quarter and uh, annual and units on the on the right-hand side of the page. So well spread right across uh, the different uh, uh, property types. And, uh, and uh, as you can see, there, sustained level of growth over the course of the year. 
Look, uh, the other component is um, the new listings. Uh, and so they're down 7.4% on the same time last year. They're actually off 16.6% on the five-year average. So it just reflects how tightly stock is held and being sought after, the uh, lack of options for purchases, uh, and so that aggressive feeding into the uh, the more um, aggressive growth that's been occurring over the last uh, numbers of months. Um, so yeah, total listings also uh, at this stage are off twenty three point six percent on last year. Total total listings off five years average off forty percent. So you're yeah, really building into that. Um, lack of new listings, lack of total listings, lack of options for purchases, as well as increased demand, uh, adding to uh, adding to pressures uh, in in the market. And that's evident as well in days on market reducing, and vendor discounting reducing on the same period last year. And as uh, Gareth was also mentioning, uh, uh, rents have um, have become uh, uh, one of the tension points. Uh, lack of options record low levels of vacancy rates uh, and strong uh, strong growth in uh, in rents occurring uh, in Brisbane. Houses 6.4, units 14, but actually more widespread right across uh, Queensland specifically uh, as well. Always like to uh, bring this to local markets and uh, this is, uh, this brings you for the last quarter the areas uh, around Brisbane, Greater Brisbane, there of the rate of price growth, the deeper the blue, the stronger the growth. Uh, and if you can see any patches that are, um, are less uh, less obvious, and I've just realised that's a picture of Sydney on the on the screen. So my apologies to everybody. I'll uh, I'll get the Brisbane one into the into the pack when that's available. Apologies today for you on that uh, as well. Moving on to uh, the local markets, then this is a this is the tabular format of that same information. Monthly uh, monthly change um, at, at a SA four region level and quarterly change, uh, again reflecting that uh, broad uh, range of growth, uh, irrespective of market and uh, strength uh, occurring across uh, or widespread across Brisbane. You'll see uh, rental value growth. Some comments there on the top right. Uh, selling days and, and a range of um, uh, a range of uh, time on market varying from 21 to 32 days, and then selling activity uh, across the different markets uh, as well. If I turn to uh, a, the table then on uh, sales volumes, you'll see you know, central uh, Queensland. Um, that, that rate of uh, change has been more modest, uh, still down significantly, but as I mentioned, off record levels of highs, whereas uh, the wide bay uh, in um, experiencing a greater level of um, change across Queensland uh, more broadly. And if I turn to the, uh, the SA4 regions across uh, regional uh, Queensland, so the, the, the locations that are known as um, specifical area fours, uh, which gives you pretty much the major uh, major cities right across Queensland. You'll see how that monthly change has been performing uh, and quarterly again at those uh, those levels. Um, Toowoomba, strongest, uh, strongest growth uh, occurring and uh, eight of the 10 regions recording monthly gains. Some comments there also around rental growth in the regions. And sales activity, as we've uh, as we've touched on uh, as well. Always important to uh, to round out the picture with uh, some insights around commercial. Industrial continues to perform strongly, notwithstanding um, the rate increases that have been occurring over the last uh, fifteen or so months. Uh, industrial has been. The, the the standout from a commercial uh, property sense with still strong demand uh, and what uh, has been easing from a, a yield perspective has actually been uh, largely uh, largely made up and captured from a um, from a lease uh, and rent uh, rent appreciation perspective and you can see there at the bottom of the chart there the, the rent appreciation that's been occurring. Uh, and uh, lack of options available. Um, whilst there has been eight projects completed, uh, there's still um, you know, significant demand in industrial precincts and uh, across the industrial asset classes more broadly. 
On retail, uh, we know Brisbane wasn't as impacted as perhaps some of the southern capitals, but notwithstanding, it's still been going through uh, some adjustment from, uh, you know, from a spending perspective. Uh, there's been, um, you know, a reduction in activity in numbers of sales that have been occurring in retail assets and some softness depending on the particular asset type uh, within the retail segment as well evident uh, at a subsector level, so you know some a mixed uh, a mixed stream of uh, insights there. And office more broadly has been uh, both the global asset uh, and the and the national asset of of focus. We've seen some uh, early uh, office sales, uh, particularly out of Sydney, early early days around evidence in in Brisbane specifically. Um, but, uh, you know, largely Brisbane has been uh, bucking the trend of the southern capitals. There has still been a flight to quality. There's still been lots of the same themes around occupancy needs of uh, footprints. Um, and, uh, and as I said, the flight to quality, but um, they're not, not, um, not the same level of uh, vacancy uh, that has been evident in southern capitals. Notwithstanding, uh, we're still early days. We're still to get uh, some key transactions to occur in the in the Brisbane market to uh, add to that evidence, and uh, so that remains um, a topic that's consumed lots of uh, lots of pages of print and uh, online uh, online forums and uh, discussions as well, and much speculated both globally and, as I say, at a uh, national level. Um, some some um, comments around uh, rent rolls. Uh, I think that's uh, for this audience really important to uh, uh, really important to add. Um, Gold and sunny coasts, um, you know, achieving strong strong multiples, um, limited uh, limited implications for from the uh, from interest rates more broadly. Uh, increasing rates uh, and low vacancy rates are obviously. Um, you know, adding to confidence, notwithstanding there is some evidence of some investors taking the opportunity to sell properties as well, which is impacts on the other side of, uh, uh, of on the other side of rent rolls and uh, and overall properties um, uh, portfolios more broadly. So, again, just uh, to give you some uh, some insights there, as is typical, you know, just some uh, areas of watch and. Uh, particularly for rent rolls that are predominantly reliant on single industry uh, more broadly. So that's, uh, you know, it's a, an ongoing theme um, just to make sure there's diversity across the portfolio as well. So perhaps with that, Donna, I might hand back to you and, uh, and welcome any questions for, uh, for Gareth or myself that you might have out of our presentations. Over to you, Donna. Thanks so much, Mark um, and Gareth. That was fantastic and certainly provided us with some key insights. Uh, reminder that we do have a uh, There's um, on the screen, I ask you to put some questions in there. I can see there's one already, but I'm going to start with a few of mine for you both. Um, Gareth, one for you. Um, what do you, what is the real indicator that you're watching when we're making this expectation for a one more November rate hike? Is there any one indicator that you're kind of really mindful of? I think you know, in in the immediate term, and we'll we'll actually get this uh, in about two weeks' time. Is is the quarterly CPI for Q3? I think that's really the trigger. If anything, um, it is a little bit difficult. We think it will challenge them in the sense that you know Q3 saw a bit of a resurgence in petrol prices, for example. Um, a very strong minimum wage outcome that was passed through. Um, but some of the good news and maybe some of the offsetting risk is that in our business survey, you know, we've actually seen some of those price pressures ease in the latest month quite a bit. So they're still high, but they're well off their peak. So I think very much all eyes in, in the near term to that that CPI. I think really what we need to see is, you know, we have got an easing trend uh, kind of in the rate of inflation. It's just, you know, is there any sign that services is increasing more strongly or has become, you know, this sort of sticky kind of inflation that we've seen a little bit overseas? Um, but really, I think it's it's a bit more broader than that. And the RBA probably be looking uh, forward as well in terms of where they see growth going and, and how the labour market plays out over the next year as well. 
Thanks. And, and what you mentioned oil. So there's been that resurgence in the oil price. Where do you see that going? Yeah, um, it's come off a little bit, but it's still high. It's one of those COVID factors where, you know, it's not so it's not a COVID factor anymore, but it's 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 like the COVID surprises where shocks just keep happening that we don't foresee and kind of rebound and pushes the price back up. So I think, you know, certainly households are seeing that in, in fuel costs. Um, the real risk is that that becomes broader. So, the, you know, the fuel costs feed through to freight costs and, you know, we see second rounds. We haven't seen too much evidence of that yet. We think as global demand cools, you know, oil prices should ease a little bit. Um, we've seen some elements of that, but yeah, the risk is at the moment as well, the kind of supply constraints out of the Middle East are kind of, you know, the upside risk. So it's one to watch. I think more broadly, uh, we can be optimistic that some of the other global prices and commodity prices have eased. And so that should offset some of that impact. Right. And what about our exchange rate? What's going on there? Yeah, look, it's quite interesting. I think in terms of the US dollar, we've certainly seen quite a strong US dollar recently, uh, despite the fact that, you know, commodity prices in terms of what we export to iron ore and coal are actually still quite high. So it's a little bit surprising. Um, I think really there it's a bit based on rate expectations and, you know, maybe people growing growing uh, a little bit more certain that we are near the peak for our rates and there is that, that gap. I think when we look at the exchange rate more broadly, it's... Probably a bit more of a US dollar story with with our kind of trade weighted, which is you know our average exchange rate with all our trading partners has been a little bit more stable. Um, I think it poses a bit of a risk to inflation a bit further down the track. Um, but at the moment, we also know that goods prices themselves globally are easing, so there is an offsetting factor yet again. Um, I think very much the focus for now is is what is that domestic pressure and how are wages flowing through. Right. With respect to Brisbane, you know, what we heard in your, in your pack was migration's up, sentiment's down in Queensland, house prices are up. Um, what do you think needs to change from an economic perspective to see more supply in the market? And Mark, I might ask this question of you and your view as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good one, Mark. We'll have some insights too. I think you know, it's difficult uh, in the short term to see how, you know, supply increases. We need kind of a big response. And I guess the hope is a little bit that, you know, we know that demand is strong. We know hopefully people become, you know, a little bit more comfortable moving on with these projects now that there's a bit more certainty on the global environment, on costs, on rates. Um but I think, you know, we also see kind of not just the materials. So the material side is easing a little bit, but the labour side of construction is still quite constrained. So in a way, population growth both helps that, but it adds to demand for housing as well. So what is the net the net balance there? But I think yeah, ultimately, as things sort of normalise a bit more, we will see that pick up in construction. It's just that it might take a little bit longer than some of us might hope. Thanks. And Mark, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, look, it's um, it, it's it, it's uh, a, a challenging one currently. As Gareth said, you know, approvals um, not where they need to be. Options to get labour is um, really constrained. You know? Then it becomes well, we, even if you could get them, where do you where do they live? So yes. you've got nearly this vicious cycle of um, don't have but can't get, and so you know, construction sector. Uh, and adding to all the infrastructure that's underway in Brisbane itself and in some of the regions as well, Donna, that's a very challenging problem to, to solve. Nothing that, uh, there's no magic wand, I don't believe. There's not, no, no quick solution to it. Um, and lots of both national as well as state and local government shared initiatives around supply uh, and, you know, the ongoing um, uh, ongoing aspects, as Gareth's mentioned, are all going to be required to be able to nudge that one uh, uh, forward into a more sustainable uh, sustainable um, uh, rhythm. Yes, I completely agree. Um, it's a challenge. Mark, um, potentially um, controversial, do you see uh, a future or a bigger future for multi-tenanted properties? multi uh, and uh, as in like well not not quite the boarding are we, are we, not the yeah boarding we, we res here donna or we um or mixed or, or some commercial perhaps re residential downs 
uh, sorry, um, uh, retail downstairs, some uh, you know, some service departments or some uh, some tenancy. Yeah, I think that's inevitable, Donna. So um, you know, that's that's often a format that um, helps to become viable uh, uh, to, to get some feasibility to the stack to to get an anchor tenant like that to, to make that that work. But again, these are long lead times, Donna. These are not going to be built in three months or six months. These, uh, you know, to secure the site, get a feasibility to stack up, get trades, as we've just been saying. Um, you know, you still, you don't get much change out of three, three plus years, probably. Yeah, and then the holding costs as well. You know, Correct. that's what's really affect. You yeah. know, it's certainly making a lot of people question. You know, their return on those investments and yeah. and um, uh, you know how that's going to be realised. Hopefully they're going to keep coming though, because we certainly need those properties for those that are coming to us in the beautiful state of Queensland. That's for sure. A couple of questions for you from our um, our community here. Uh, Roberts asked, and I think this one's for you, Mark. What do you expect to see in capitalisation rates and property vals across resi and commercial as a result of interest rate increases, and how long before this is realised in market? Uh, yeah, good question, uh, Donna. Um, you know, we've seen uh, we've, we've seen so far um, official rates go up four uh, percent. Typically, long term investments, uh, you know, for, for commercial properties, for example, are set off a ten year rate, which um, has actually also gone up, but not not to that uh, not to that degree. Uh, so, you know, important that we work through. Um, work through that. I, I still think there's an, at least another 12 months, 15 months to, for all to, to progressively unwind. There's not really any examples of forced um, you know, forced sales here in, here in the country really yet. Um, there's, there's obviously a standoff between vendors and purchasers uh, uh, as to what the level should be. Um, so as well as the other demographic uh, uh, related you know, factors of people moving to Queensland, as well as, um, you know, what what level of office occupancy over the case. There's lots of moving pieces all at once, as well as uh, what's happening on the rate side. So where it lands, um, I think uh, you know everyone could have a crystal ball on that. But it, it's it's certainly still got more more to unwind from the from the quite sharp levels that were were there. Probably office is the sector that that everyone is expecting to unwind still further as opposed to uh, the other asset classes um, would be a, a, another comment just to add to that uh, to that response, Donna. Yeah, the other two seemed really still trending in the right direction. Um, so um, Hazel's got a question. Uh, what's the sentiment views in terms of the recovery of the residential construction se sector? Is there continued concerns regarding developers, builders going bust? Well, the RBA on Friday came out saying, you know, thirty percent of um, of builders, uh, we're talking, uh, you know, domestic builders, for example, um, you know, still cash flow, cash flow, uh, really challenged in their cash flow situation. Uh, I fear we're not at the end of that yet, Donna. To be to be real, um, I would I would love that not to be true, of course, but um, there, there's still, um, you know, still a big. Um, you know, a big pipeline to get through, and uh, whilst perhaps, as, as Gareth said, some of the the, um, the the key construction materials have settled in their prices, that the pressure's in trades to to actually get trades. I have heard of some builders really slowing down on you know uh, the the uh, the builds they're taking on to protect the margins, yeah. being a lot more selective on. Um, those builds from margins and I guess that might if, if there's more of them might have a material effect on trade availability if they're going to start slowing just doing the the more profitable ones which you know we, is certainly in my view a wiser course of action rather than you know over trading and putting yourself out there um here's a question I like this and I want to remind everybody we're not here to give financial advice today but if you had a million dollars um, more to invest in pro the property market in Queensland. Where and what type of property would you would be on your list? Are you going to go there, Mark? Well, I've uh, I've got Sunny Coast on my mind as my uh, as, as my um, 
desired uh, location for the long term. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll stick it there, but not for investment reasons, not us. So, uh, but um, but I probably wouldn't get that much now on, on the sunny coast. So I'm gonna have to be pretty you pretty select pretty selective. So I probably uh, wouldn't wouldn't get my oceanfront uh, villa that I probably want. Uh, but yes, that that would be uh, that's that's where I'm uh, hoping to relocate to in time. Yeah, no, that's that's a great place. Uh, as is the Gold Coast. Uh, you know, they're both uh, very popular right now. I can tell you, Mark. Agreed. Uh, anything we've missed, Gareth? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's been quite a good discussion. I think. Maybe a bit on the construction side, I'd offer some optimism. I think Mark's right. We'd never rule anything out given everything that's that's played out over the last few years. And certainly, you know, costs themselves probably haven't really reversed either. So still challenges, but our business survey has shown, you know, generally conditions of ease for most industries, but construction's actually ticked up a little bit recently. And part of that has been profitability. So maybe, maybe some cautious optimism there on a bit of an adjustment in terms of how they do pricing of the contracts, you know, and maybe a bit of coordination, like you say, kind of slowing down projects is obviously big spillovers from, from the big infrastructure spend as well in kind of a few of the States. But other than that, you know, it's sort of, sort of, hopefully we don't come across as too negative in these things in an economic sense. I mean, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic, right? I think, you know, rates kind of are at or near their peak, hopefully, um, certainly an adjustment going on for for some households more than others. Um, but ultimately, you know, historically rates aren't as high as they've been. And also, you know, the labour market is quite strong, right? So hopefully the thing is we avoid a major downturn. Uh, we kind of get through this adjustment before the RBA is kind of able to ease rates a little bit more back to neutral at, at some point in the future. I'm going to ask one more question. Do you think there'll ever be a move considering uh, on stamp duties? Um, considering, you know, I think I feel there's a lot of baby boomers and that who are still sitting in their house because of just because of that that exchange cost with respect to stamp duties. Yeah, I think it's a, I mean, it's a huge issue, right? Like some of the the challenges we talk about, it's not just the housing market, I guess. It's it's things like the labour market and productivity. You know, quite a bit of focus and you know restricting labour mobility between the states or or at all is kind of you know is an issue um you know we've maybe encouragingly we've seen a bit of appetite for that in some places it's obviously quite hard to do uh, wholesale and more broadly but i think you know tax more broadly but including the stamp duty will be hopefully one of the important sort of reforms that we do see over time but kind of like mark said about construction it's it's not a three month or a six month thing it's probably going to take a little bit longer than that yeah, no, that's great. Well, I think one more question came up. Um, and then we, this might be our last question, though. Let me just have a quick look. Uh, any regulation reform changes that we need to be aware of? I'm not sure. Anything for you, Mark? Anything, Gareth? I suspect that's you, Mark. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fine. I, I guess the, one, the, the ones to keep aware of, um, you know, given different overseas jurisdictions and even different states here in Australia have dabbled with it, council level as well, is, um, you know, Airbnb um, uh, taxes and the like, uh, you know, depending on how um, uh, both both the, the council of, uh, of governments as well as, you know, state governments want to react, um, you know, and, uh, and try and stimulate availability, you, we, we should just keep aware of, those types of levers that might be played. There's nothing um, uh, apart from the the, the short term flirt last year, Donna. Yeah. That's uh, that's happened to to talk about. But I think we should just remain um, open right. and, and aware of those types of um, uh, things that can can occur. And, and that that shouldn't panic us. That just it's just a means to be aware of and plan for different contingencies as part of of working through a normal business uh, cycle or investment investment approaches. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think uh, Hobart we're talking about, or if not, yeah. had enacted something to that effect, and it it could materially change the affordability rate, uh, affordability um, capacity for some of our customers. That's for sure. Um, okay. Well, uh, to be honest, thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, it's been fascinating, uh, and we really appreciate 
you uh, joining us today and we appreciate everyone else who's taken the time uh, to join us uh, on this webinar. Remember, there will be a survey at the end. We'd really appreciate your take participating in that. If you get a copy of the webinar, we're happy for you to share it amongst your friends, network uh, and colleagues. Um, and we hope to welcome you back again to our next webinar uh, on the topics and hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.